um, if we start by looking at a molecule, a molecule will have a kinetic energy. And we know that that kinetic energy is defined by the mass of the particle and the speed of the particle squared divided by two. We also know that this kinetic energy depends on the temperature and um, it can take any value you want. So if you have a low temperature, you have a rather small distribution, but it's still, it can take energy, any energy within this distribution. As you increase the temperature, the molecules are starting to move faster. And you can see this here in this slide where they increase the temperature with the bar and they are moving faster. And then as the temperature is increased even more, it can take even more kinetic energies. And now at really high temperature, you have a very broad distribution of kinetic energies. But those energies uh, can take any value. And that is important for molecules, the kinetic energy can take any value. What about if we go to an electron? So we have to think a little bit differently. So if we have an electron and we put it in a box, the first thing we have to do is to create this box. So we draw a box. And then Schrodinger and his uh, colleagues, they found in the beginning of the 1900 that uh, these particles, the electrons, they take specific discrete energy values. They can no longer take any energy they want. They have specific energy values, so discrete energy values. Also, the energy cannot be zero. And they found that the energy differences between these energy levels or the energy values that you could take depends on, uh, on where you are in the box. So at low energies, which is in the bottom of the box, and then as we increase the energy, these energy differences are increasing. So the difference between the energy levels are increasing according to this theory that was initially proposed. And it was also proposed that we can calculate mathematically the energy of these individual energy levels. As I said, this was de derived in the beginning of the 1900. And um, what came up was this model of the particle in the box. And what I'm going to be now is be quiet and I ask you to read and follow this video a little bit. So look, we have shrunk the box from one meter to 10 in the power of minus six. It's very small. It's the atomic scale now. And start looking at the particle. It start to behave like a wave. It did not behave like that before. Before it was just going forward and back. And depending on the energy or where we are in the, these energy levels that we introduced, the wave will have different shapes. So that was um, uh, found by uh, out, I'm just going to move this one so you can, we can actually see the window. So what we found, what was found by this early quantum mechanics or these theories was that an electron doesn't only behave as a particle, but it also has this wave function, it behaves as a wave. And that is what is the dual properties of an electron or a quantum particle. And it was also found that they obey an equation that was described by Schrodinger. So therefore it is described as Schrodinger's equation. And it depends on this energy, but it also depends on this function here, which is called psi. And in this case, it depends on X which is the one dimensional box. And the psi is our wave function. 
and Schrodinger showed that psi function can be described by a sinus function and a cos function, where A and B are constants. And um, further, it was shown that this term K has a specific value that depends on the mass of the particle and the energy and the uh, constant called Planck's constant, a bar constant. And we come back to that constant later on. So let us now then describe this, um, um, this box and what is the implication of it. We don't have to understand the maths at this point, but just understand what the box is actually doing and what the particle is doing and why we have this quantitized energy levels. So we start by creating our box. And the thing we do is that we impose something called boundary conditions. We say that the walls of this boundary, I'm just going to change my laser now, this walls has an infinite height. That means that the particle must be inside the box because the walls are so high that it cannot escape outside. So we put a barrier on the outside of the box. That means that the particle must be inside. And that means that in the walls, this psi uh, and cos function, that wave function that we derived before, must be zero if we are at the wall. And that is when x is zero and what we are at this other end of the end of the box, which is L, the length of the box. And that is true if sinus zero, because X is zero, that is zero, that is coming back to our maps. Um, and then it's also true, uh, uh, but it's not true for the cos function, because if we go to X equals zero, the cos function is one. So that means that this constant B must be zero. Or that means that we have simplified our wave function to be only a sinus function, and that is really helpful. And then we replace our K value with the constant we had before, and then we can solve for E. And I'm not going to do that in this lecture here, but if we do that, we get this equation that I had derived before. So what does it mean? I have L, which is the length of my box, M, which is the mass of the electron or the particle, the same as we had for the classical particle. But I have an, an integer here, N, one, two, three. And what is that? That N is actually the number of the energy levels. It's a quantum number, it's called. And that N is one, we can calculate the energy for energy level one. If n is two, we can calculate the energy level for two and so on. And what you see is there is no zero. That means that we have no, the energy cannot be possible with zero. So we have a zero point energy, which means that there's an electron always have some kinetic energy. That's really important, even at zero Kelvin then electron has a kinetic energy. That was the energy. What about the wave function then? The wave function we said was given by this uh, sinus function, which also depends on this quantum number n. And we, we put that one in, we get n equals one, two, three, and so on. And if we look at it, these wave functions will look differently for n equals one, uh, two, and uh, so for one, two, three, four, and five, and so on. So the wave function will look differently. And what I want you to do now is that you are going to try to predict how the wave function for n equals three and n equals four look like. 
And um, we start by looking at the n equals one. If you can see, it is the, uh, the it has no crossing of this blue line. So it has the same, the way we say that the wave function has the same sign all the time. If we look at the blue one, it is above and below. So it's positive and it's negative. And that means that when we cross, when the wave function change sign, we have a node. And you can see for n equals one, there is no node, zero nodes. For n equals two, we have one node. So how many nodes do you think n3 and n4 has? What we find is that n equals three has two nodes, one, two, four has one, two, three nodes. So the number of nodes are one less the quantum number. So that was something that can be useful to remember. But what the key point of this first part of the lecture was, was that you should know what is a quantitized particle or energy levels and what is zero point energy. And uh, that a, part, uh, a quantum particle has both particle and wave properties. And you should know what the quantum number is and that it's increasing as the nodes are increasing in, that the nodes are increasing with the quantum number. Because that means, if we go back and have a quick look at this picture, it means that the wave number or the wave is increasing. So the, the wavelengths are getting shorter. So it has more energy. 